I get at least one Canadian joke in, because he always includes one of those. He likes to put the toe in skirt depth. So that's it. That's, that's my Canadian joke for you. Um, I'm going to talk about web font and, and web typography. And I know there's going to be some more people um, coming in after lunch and wanting to get back and back, so it's pretty epic. Um, but I want to make sure that we get started just so that there's plenty of time for questions at the end, because I think that it's still a topic. Have lots of questions about. So we want to try and do something different, and we want to try and make sure that we take design to another level and use Drupal in the best way possible to do that. Um, so I've been designing websites and building them for a long time. Um, I started doing this when I was in college, designing the school clerk site um, for Netscape One and Novae. So I've, I've kind of been through a lot of different ways of handling that problem. And so um, what we're going to try and cover today is as quickly as I can um, encapsulate the history of graphic design and typography um, and move through things about web font, um, what's working now, what's not, and, and how we can use the tools available to us to make it just that much more awesome. Um, Morton's always about getting an awesome thought, and so I want to make sure that we can get that kind of so, I will not spend the whole time talking about that topic. I might stick around for the next couple of minutes, but I'll tell you right now. Um, it is just not always the best tool. Um, and the reason for that is seeing that on 5 billion web pages is really, really boring. Well, maybe if they all said this type of stuff, that would actually be kind of entertaining. Um, but seeing everything set in the same font is like always looking at a bunch of people in the same place, or always trying to read books that actually have the same text, except for lots of more in this book. Um, you don't have to do that. And, and the thing about type is that this is the physical embodiment of the message that you're trying to deliver. And by always using a couple of different typefaces, you really start to diminish its impact. Our clients and our employers spend a huge amount of money developing a brand. And in order to support that brand and deliver that message, it is very often conveyed with the size, shape, and color and tone of the text and the letters that are part of that name. Everybody knows what the domain looks like in the IBM logo. Everybody knows So these things are very characteristic and they really help define um, the image. And when we don't use the tools available to us to really carry that message forward, then we really start to give things up. Um, there are basic things about graphic design that help convey message. Um, there's image, color, composition, the words that are on the page, and the letters themselves. And to, to go with more of a strict design philosophy, Bill Bates, the old guy, uh, likes to call better to convey only the meaning of the words that you put on the page. There should be no emotion, no color or tone that is inferred from those letters. That's taking away the one thing that covers the biggest percentage of the page on a website. So your ability to deliver design and to deliver message and meaning and emotion that covers the biggest percentage by not using and taking advantage of these fonts that we can add to our design language and our vocabulary as, as designers, um, we're taking away a huge chunk of what we have to work with. So, 17 years, strict type designers and philosophers of that sense have been living on it. This is their heyday. Um, we only wanted to make text as gifts. So we all just had times in Havana and Georgia and all around the world. And that was pretty much it. So over the time, uh, we've had a few different things that have developed. So we have text as gifts. We have font tags in HTML. Um, two comments differ if you've used it. I'm sorry. I tried it too. We need to kind of move past that because we have things that actually can bring this to our design without causing us physical harm in the process. So 
there's a lot we can do. So a lot of things happen now with the development of that part which, which actually came out in CSS2, was dropped in CSS2.1, and is now back in CSS3 with support. We have support from smart vendors. We have support from the browser. We have support from the people who push web standards forward. So, by doing this, we're pushing it forward, creating a stronger demand, which in turn comes back to the evolution of better technologies and a better experience for all of us on the web. So, um, starting about two years ago, TypeKit launched. TypeKit was uh, a service of which I'm a fan. Um, I use it often, and it makes it very easy um, to with a line or two of JavaScript embed a lot of great typefaces. Um, and it has sparked the revolution of these air fans and flag, um, which now you see almost as often as um, I was just uh, among type And that's not that big a date, but I really do like the type of thing. But um, Fontdeck has come along. Fonts.com has come along. Um, there are actually about, I think, 12 or so different commercial services that allow you to embed fonts on your site and not have to host them yourself. And there are also options that do look like this yourself. So, uh, if with a line or two of code, you can add great typefaces to your site. Um, that can be done for a module, it can be done in your team, it doesn't really matter, it's very easy to do. And you also have this option of using Google Fonts and then just posting them yourself. And, and you should try it. Um, it's not that difficult to do. It's more effort to host it yourself, but it actually gives you a stronger understanding of exactly how it all works. Um, so that way you can then turn around and say, um, it, it may be better to let somebody else handle some of these things. So if I use the service, and I won't have to keep up with some of it. It's still developing. You have to remember that this is still essentially brand new. Um, it has been around for a little while, a year or two, um, but the standards for font format are changing. There is no one format of web font that you can use across every platform and browser. There's at least three that you have to worry about. Um, there's an open type format, there's a block format, there's an EOP format that is like a more um, I, I actually don't have them all to take my tongue because I got super trying to set it up myself and work back to the source. So, why is it such a problem? Um, mainly because of this. Fonts uh, were developed for print. They were developed to put interesting shapes of characters on a printed page. The fact that it comes on shows on the screen at all is primarily because we have a lot of history to write this up in the first place. Um, that's not what the primary motivator was to create fonts to look good on the screen. So, this is this need and the explosion of devices on which we want to display them is still fairly new. So it means that companies have to go back and adjust how things work, often at uh, you know, literally trying to split pixels. So you have displays with resolutions ranging from 72 dots per inch up to over 300 dots per inch. And you're trying to get a letter form to render well at 6 or 7 or 8 or 9 point type across all of them when you have no idea physically how big that point size is actually going to represent. It used to be something that actually was a physical measurement. Now it's really just a standard reference point for it. So you say 72 DPI and you say something for the web. Or if you use Windows, you say 96. Already there's kind of diverged and it's split back. So um, there are lots of issues. And most of those issues are actually related to looking at fonts on Windows. So that's why I do jump on Windows a little bit, because what it means is that font companies have to go back and spend hundreds and hundreds of hours by hand printing these typefaces to render well in that rendering engine on those screens. So when you pick a great font and you look at it and you think it's amazing on your MacBook, and then you have to go and show it to a client and they look at it and say, oh, it kind of looks like that. Really looking all that great. So you probably have to look at it in Windows XP and you 
realize that it really does look like that. But not every part does. So parts that are well made are ones that will look good. And you need to pick and choose and pack. So these are the kinds of things that you have to do to make parts work well in all environments. Um, you can learn a lot more by going to those blogs. I, I know a bit about web technology and web fonts, but there are many people that know a lot more. And so I really encourage you to read more about it there. And we are a Drupal conference. I don't want to stand up here all day and just talk to you about commercial services um, because there are open alternatives. Um, there is possible for you to go to uh, google.com slash web fonts. And there's a huge library of fonts that you can download. And there are also ones that have a I know lots of other things that you can do there. Um, and I'm going to get into a couple of them that actually help the process of embedding your fonts work better. Um, but this is a very important point to remember. This is not Google's core business. Open source fonts are a nice thing to be able to have. However, there is an enormous amount of effort that goes into making any one font look great. So you cannot expect that every type designer is going to deliver this really phenomenally well done, thought out, completely executed font and give it away for free. So you will find some good ones and you'll find some that are not so good. Um, Google has provided some enabling technologies and they're really good at that, um, but they're not effective. So um, the commercial services are really dedicated. So they're going back, and Adobe is doing this, and Monotype is doing this, and they are taking it upon themselves to put a lot of this extra effort in in order to make their stuff work better on the web because they know this is where it needs to work. And that is their dedication. So by using link service, you're leveraging all that effort that's going on. And oftentimes, your stuff just keeps starting to work better without you having to do a thing. And that's great. I mean, it's really wonderful. All the services are doing that. All the font vendors are really starting to get behind it. Even HMSJ is going to have a web font solution supposedly by the end of the year. And so all of the hipster designers are rejoicing over that. Our care and confidence are coming. Um, so, Drupal, we want to relate it back to Drupal. It is actually all why we're all here. Um, but there are lots of different font services. And they all have slightly different ways of having these things embed back in their stuff. Um, most often it's one line that goes to a JavaScript or a CSS that goes in your site, but it's always a different source, it's a different syntax, it's a different choice whether or not they support HTTP or HTTPS. Um, do they support the Google Web Font Loader? Which we'll come back to in a few minutes. Um, and so there are lots of things about that that make this a little bit prettier than you might necessarily want it to be. And you also have common things about getting these fonts in that you'd like to be able to do all together. So there are some modules that do allow you to bring a font service um, into your feed and your site. And there's one that I've been working on with Scott Raymond, this at Font Workbase module, that is still, it's still developing. But the, the interesting thing about it is that Scott took the approach of saying, defining selectors and looking at the fonts that you've enabled is a common task across all services. So how about sub-modules to bring in the fonts from each service and then have one place where you can view the ones that you have enabled and then assign them to selectors if that's how you want to do it. So that's been an interesting thing. Scott's doing some interesting work and he's actually had a lot of support from monetize on this, which is really good. And, and that's moving along. Um, whether or not that's the eventual solution doesn't really matter. But the fact is that there's a lot of attention being paid. Um, uh, a fellow named Ben who I met today has a great uh, module that he's developed for the Google Web Fonts service. So that, you know, that's the one that we're focusing on. Um, it's really well done. Uh, he showed it to me this morning, and I wish that I had had more time um, to play around with it. Uh, I worked on the original TypeKit module that was sort of pre-API, and Really, all that did was connect you to your account. But it was nice and simple, and it worked. And, and there's been a nice evolution of increased functionality um, 
and it's really great to see the ability to preview lots of products right in your team. So there's lots of people who don't want to put all the skill sets in their own team that actually want to have it in the admin to allow the site owner to do more. And, and that's really become a problem. So it lets you focus on the stuff that you know. You know how to build a Google site. You know how to build a team. You know how to configure everything. And you want us to make sure that you get to use your secret sauce and your you know, perfect blend of spices and modules that we use every time we build, build a Drupal site. Um, you want to make sure that you do the same thing with your website. You want to make sure that they're loading well, that they're falling back well, that they're going to work on all these different devices, and that they're going to render nicely whether it's on a mobile phone or a desktop at whatever speed. And there are things that you can do to make that much, much better. Um, there's, there's a litany of things here, and I am covering kind of a broad range of, of design and typography all the way through implementation. So um, I apologize if it's been too basic for some or if it's been kind of get maybe a little too technical for others, but it is a range of things that you do need to consider. Um, using web font for body copy is the fastest way to make your entire site feel different than anything else that you can do. Take Arial out of the equation and set your body copy in a really nice font that renders really well. If you want something nice to run, try to help out. If you want to have a really nice font that um, is a little bit more closely paired to something like Helvetica, a little bit narrow and more traditional type of font, um, there, you know, there, there are nice typefaces. They have extensive weights. You can use them in a lot of variety of different ways. Um, and there's no reason not to incorporate into that into your overall design. It will work, it will render, and it will give you a really nice experience. Um, but you, there's no substitution for testing. Um, you pick the, the font, you've got to test it in all these different iterations and make sure that it really looks good and renders well before you go too far down the road of being completely confident to using that one place. Um, because if it looks great to everybody except for the CEO who has a really crappy laptop and who looks out and next to you on the even if it's in seven, it's still going to look terrible, and he's not going to he's not going to prove it. And then you're going to be back in the end. Um, clear type is another little thing that you need to know about Windows XP because by default it is hot. It is like taking fonts and moving a bunch of areas and then Photoshop and sticking it and pretending that it's 1996. Um, that's what it looks like, and you can't do anything about it. It is on by default in Vista and Windows 7. You have a significant user base that is dealing with an older Windows operating system. This is something of which you need to be aware. So you have to test and you have to see how it's going to work with clear type on or off. Um, again, come back to this one line. Go sign up for a free account on webfonts.fonts.com or typekit.com or fontfest.com or webfonts.com. Go to Google. Try it out. See how this stuff works before you can really make use of it and leverage it in the process. Now we're going to come to this other thing that um, people talk about, which is fat. Is it fat or is it fat? Or ugliness? Because browsers handle it differently. We have the Firefox browsers that are more engineering specific, which will draw your page without your web font loaded while the font is downloading. And then Good, or you have a whole lot of nothing. If you have a web kit based browser, the approach is you don't draw anything on the screen until you have the front page set up. So if you have lots of fonts downloading, you see this for a moment or two, then you see the rest of the stuff in there. And that can be really jarring. And, you know, as, a, as someone who has been working on the web for getting close to 20 years, I know that nothing is in there. I know that stuff takes time to download. And I know the why of that because I built it. But then the other 99% of people out there who are like the people in this room have no understanding of why it's taking longer for this to load. And they get very frustrated. So there's things, you know, this term, about a class of unstyled text, is what happens before the fonts load. Because they do have to load, they do get punished, but there are pieces of it that have to come in every page. And there is a, a certain amount of delay before everything is ready to be drawn on the screen. And 
there are two different ways that it's handled. Either the five box approach of unstyled and then styled, or nothing and then styled and wet the fabric. And either one of those can be a complete deal breaker for some clients. And, and that's something that you have to mitigate either by design or by convincing them that it doesn't matter. But Google's web software, which was something that was developed and released last year, um, is something that allows us to get a handle on it and do something with intent. Level the plan field between the browsers and actually do something to make it look good or look more like your intended design until the web cost goes and everything has to be So, um, cost.com supports it, TypeKit supports it, Google obviously supports it through their API. Um, I don't know if any of the other services offer this one. And the reason is um, because of how it's added to the page. Some services use CSS only, some will use JavaScript, some will offer both. So by injecting it with JavaScript um, to add the web fonts, it will, using the web font loader, inject classes into the HTML tag on your code during the process of these fonts loading, so that you, with your CSS, can know and apply the appropriate style and the appropriate font style, whether or not knowing whether or not those web fonts are loaded. And that is incredibly powerful. It really helps you do a lot of interesting things. So you get a class, WF, Loading or hyphen loading um, or WF inactive or WF active injected into your page. Um, there are a couple others, so go to the Google Web Font API and documentation and check that out. But those are kind of the key ones. So you know when it's coming, you know once it's active, or if it fails, you know that too. So in your CSS, you can have a regular stanza for how it looks with your whole font stack with the web font and everything else after it. So that you have your callback for it. Then you can also have a stanza immediately after that that has WF inactive space H1. So the H1s will render with this bit of H of CSS. And you can alter a few things to start to pair that up. Um, there's, uh, there's a bunch of extra work here, but um, there's this term responsive design um, that's been talked about by Ethan Mumcott quite a lot. Written a great book about it from a book point, and I do encourage you to, to read it um, because it will change the way you design your site. It certainly changed it for me. Um, and that has a lot more to do with how a website behaves going from a mobile device on up to the desktop or vice versa. Um, but your CSS really should be the same way. Um, are the web fonts there, or are they coming? Are they here, or do they fail to load? You need to plan for those things and make sure that your design will act appropriately for all of those cases. So having the web font not load often means that your page completely reflows. So all the things you would expect about your navigation layout and everything else could be completely different because uh, the fallback font might be a lot wider or might render a little bit bigger so that your text is all completely different. Your line breaks are all off, your wrapping of text is off, your navigation is now on two lines instead of one. Um, that can be really ugly, either during the load process or if it fails to load all the time. Um, you want to make sure that it holds up on other devices and all these other things. And this last little bit here, how many of us style a 404 page? Some, but there's only a few. How many people style the search results page? Again, there's, there's more hands there. I'm, I'm happy about that. I, I sometimes forget. But what about no JavaScript? You know, it's getting smaller and smaller as in terms of a percentage, but even if it was, say, 5% of people that encounter your site that don't have JavaScript enabled because of their corporate environment or because for some other reason it's just not working, JavaScript development at least, it happens in browsers all the time. So that, that's something that you really want to make sure is, is there. So what I've begun to do is to make sure that I have everything loaded using JavaScript so I can do all the things I want to do to make my design with intent. And then I'll wrap a note script tag around the embed in CSS. So that way, uncover. If JavaScript isn't there, it's going to load anyway. I'll lose a little bit of my fine tuning. But at least the, uh, the end goal of my page being rendered with the fonts that I want in the way that I want them is going to hold up. Make things go wrong. Now, 
always go out, especially when we're on stage with the general. That's why I'm not going to do it. I'll say it's been fun. But um, that's, uh, that's just the professional thing to do. And, and the nice thing about this, and what I'm getting at, is that you can do a lot of this stuff once, and then you can reuse that. So it's like having a nice starter kit. Do a lot of these things to set things in place, and then every time you do a new site, you really just find things. So you don't have to repeat the stuff all the time. It's, it's like using a CMS that you can actually download and kind of uh, save yourself a lot of time. Some people might like that. Um, so, uh, at DrupalCon last, um, last spring in Chicago, um, I spent a good hour, hour and a half in a bar with a bunch of cool developers trying to get into the things that were on I'm sure there are plenty of people in here uh, who might have that opinion or might have that opinion passed on to them from developers that they work with. Um, and that is often our own fault as designers. And that is because there is not enough understanding of what the implications are of going to a service like Boss.com or Teleport or any of these and saying, oh, I think I got this. Well, I just turned it all on and I have 15 weights of this typeface and all these different styles. And that kit that is loaded that is loaded from one of these services is adding about 700 k to the bad of that code. And I just brought everything to a crawl. And every developer that looks at that and works with it and sees the response time on that code is going to crawl. And then they're going to just quit. And then they're going to remove it from your team and not play it. And so those things are, are really important. But when we design, we don't use 15 weights of the code. We know that. It's the hook in the And so you want to use these things with care and only enable the weights that you need. Or go through the process and then at least turn them off when you know you're not going to use the medium, bold, and hard variants of some other subset. Um, I'm butchering this a little bit, and I know some people are probably more cringing, but that's okay. Um, so you want to use the things with care and only load the things that you really need. Use the web clock loading so that the page is still going to do its thing, it's still going to drag. Still going to look proper and be laid out in the right way and reduce the initial load time for the user and then snap it. Make sure that you have all of those fallback options in place and let somebody else handle starting the problems. That is one of the big problems because you get the file and you put it up on the server, you need to maintain the file, you need to maintain the form. And if you don't know if the browser maker has done anything, some of these evolving CSS standards. You don't know if the type vendor has improved the thinking in that font, and you'll never get it because you don't know. You haven't gone back to check to see if there's a new version to download. And your website is probably hosted on a single server or a DB in a data center somewhere. And you get your small allotment of bandwidth, and you have this single location where your stuff is being stored. And you have visitors coming from 46 different geographic distribution areas that are getting incredibly widely varying performance because all your stuff's being stored in one place. So the biggest chunk of download is actually going to be from a product service and you could use a service that has a CDN and let somebody else post these files geographically all over the world, handle all of the improvements that are going to be made in those and the and everything else, and then you just get the benefits from that and you take somebody else or whatever it is for one of these services. And it really takes so you're going to put your video somewhere else. Put your images somewhere else. Put your thoughts somewhere else. Let somebody else manage that. You go about your business being a Google designer and developer and make your money that way. And don't sweat the things about um, is the core patched? Um, is the operating system patched? You don't want to worry about those things either. You want to worry about making websites. It's the same, it's the same concept that I really am trying to become a very strong believer in. But then, you know, there's also the big topic of internationalization. And um, I apologize that I didn't get the English translation right to the word Japanese, but that's what it's supposed to be. Um, file sizes for these an individual weight of a font is usually about 40 to 60 k to the page. And if you want something that supports Arabic, a full type or set it off and be 200 k or more, that's nothing compared to Japanese. Nothing compared to British, where might be two minutes, and might be six. And that's for one weight. Much more than one bolt of I don't know how good lightning is right off, but that is still it's a big issue. So you want to make sure that what you're doing is actually 
don't want the whole thing and you want to stop that. So, parts.com does something really interesting, right? They will actually look at the page and they will say, all right, well, we know what's in this page. What we're going to do not 6,000 characters or 16,000 characters. We're going to do over 50 because that's all that's used in the page. So, that's currently working. And it's doing an amazing job of allowing beautiful typography on websites and Japanese in a way that has never before been possible. And eventually, I'm sure more creators will support it. But we had a little conversation um, before the session. And if you take that idea and you think about what is the piece in the middle that actually knows the content and what it serves to the user, there's a scale message. So there's a potential. You know, what if we could do that all the time? And I, I think that's a really interesting idea. And, um, you know, it's still, it is just an idea. But what if we do that on everything? So instead of having to download 300 million fonts, what if they have to download 20 or 50? Basically, because you can actually play with everything. Now, this is a font manager issue. And it, it's, a, it's a CMS issue. But it is one that we as Google users and, um, and contributors to care about because that makes the whole experience better and it uses something like people in a way um, that's better and different than what anybody else is doing. So there's immense potential for Drupal to be an even bigger part of the solution of delivering better web content design than really anything else could be. And, and that's, that's kind of the So, um, again, it is a lot of work. Um, you do need to uh, spend a lot of time looking at your design and fonts on and off. You have to spend time looking at your fonts corrected and not. Um, and, and you do have to put some effort into it. But um, you really have a big win there for users because they have um, a better experience looking at this site. Um, the client wins because they have better engagement on that site and they have better branding that's carried throughout. We win because we get better work. You know, if you design a site that visually, you know, say the mo- other elements are roughly the same with something somebody else is doing, but your site has an engaging experience that is significantly more interesting and, and sticky um, and appealing because you use better typography, that's a pretty big win. It gets you to get it on that site. I mean, it's an easy thing for you to have. I mean, as graphic designers, we're used to picking type. As web designers, we're used to suck up. So if you bring these things in here, you cook what you do, your clients get better things out of it, you get a better portfolio, you get better work. And by pushing these things as designers, we also push the standards forward, we push the adoption, and more things happen in the standards by the surprise of the front vendors to support the product and design. That's the tradition of the web, that's how it's worked from the beginning. So coming back to Drupal, um, think about our secret sauce and a lot of this stuff being something that we can repeat would help us start a team that we actually put all of these things in. And it's all in our base fashion. So that way, when you start out when you're on a new site, you have your reset in there. You have all of the stuff in there that you like to tweak in Beta Fusion or Omega in your starter that you have already kind of ready to go. Um, now you can put all your fun stuff in there too. And that way, it's, it's just taking it that extra little bit. It's an, it's an incremental, smaller amount of work on every subsequent site that really helps your work stand out. So that's really the big thing, is that um, it, it's carrying that degree of, of intent in your design all the way to the finish line. Don't stop with good introduction. Don't stop at enough help for it. Take it all the way through to how amazingly beautiful it has looked on the photo of work that you did. That's the one good thing I can say. So you may as well do that. Um, I've taken that and a whole bunch of ideas about responsive design, and I've brought that into the base team that I use at this company, Schoolyard, which is a company that does websites for public schools on a Google based platform. Um, I have a starter site set up that has my secret sauce in it, and it has my responsive theme that I've developed this, um, just over the past month or so that handles adjusting all the things about responsive design, but it also has, I guess, what I would call responsive typography. So, um, so, I mean, I think that's the idea, is that you have, um, your typography should work with the intent 
content and the breaks and everything else that, that is um, as part of your design. And then you have to deal with all the ways that might not work. And again, you get all those things in place. Now when I go to build a new site, I'm so much further along and those tweaks and refinements are the little things that take us over to a instead of having to stop at eight or nine and getting hung up on technical issues. So you really want to just try to solve those things. Um, so um, that little bit we went over there is a, a link to a blog post that I wrote that just went on cross.com yesterday that includes a demo that you can download that has a lot of this stuff in it. So you can take a lot of these ideas and put them right into what you are using. Um, so this is a snippet of that page um, as the web fonts should be. That's what it looks like when web fonts are turned on. You can see what happens. Everything changes. The type size is different. The line height is different. The letter spacing is different. It's really kind of ugly. But with a few simple things, using these classes that are injected from the web font loader and then layering it into my CSS, it can start to get closer. And then when those web fonts come in, there's a very perceptible difference. It is something that just looks like a gift finally going to its final pass. And you can get that to work almost identically across all of that. Now, there is a caveat here because apparently, this may be news to some, um, a pixel is not exactly a pixel when you go from Firefox to Safari. And I had this explained to you last night that there is a completely different rendering approach that is taken by the browser so that when you say light spacing on that text should be minus 0.3 pixels, that again is no longer a visual rendering. It's just not going to be perfect. But I have been able to test it so that an entire page of text does not be flow on a single line in any of those browsers so that nothing is going to change. You have to test it and tweak it a little bit, but you can get really, really, really close. And then, you know, there's just that short delay and then everything steps into place and you don't have a client that comes back and says, you know, the fonts are great and all, but I don't like the fact that it reflows, so pull them out. All your time and effort is wasted if you don't carry it through that last little step to make sure that the person who signs the check is going to believe in it. So you've got to do it. You've got to bring these things in here because I guarantee you it will happen just as it will happen by somebody saying, you know, the admin process isn't really so great, maybe you shouldn't do Drupal. Because that happens too. And that's why we have modules that help us fix that. And that's why Drupal 7 came out with a whole new admin file. We have to address these things ourselves to make sure that we can use the tools that we think are right for the time. So, um, check out the article. It's got a much better explanation of technically how you do these things. And it also has that sample stuff that you can download. Um, and it includes a little bit of a, a toggle that you can incorporate in a block in your theme that you can add and then turn these things on and off with the support of the It's not something you can leave live because, in my limited knowledge of jQuery, it requires like loading of jQuery as an original thing that um, people really enjoy. But maybe somebody can help me with that. Um, so, having that little toggle there lets you just turn things on and off. Um, and, and that way you can test your design a lot more quickly and really see how things work. Um, and lastly, I do want to say that while um, I don't wait for fonts all the time, I really think they're pretty cool. And they have been great friends for the Google community. And um, the fact that they're here really says a lot. Um, so thank you, guys. Um, and Fuya is a really big supporter of the work that I do. And they really let me get to dig into some of these things and really learn about how this stuff can work and make it better across many, many sites and then share it with all So without that, I wouldn't really be able to do this kind of thing. Um, and uh, I've got a few more resources here for you. And this is all available to download. Um, the slides are up. Um, I think I need to make them updated too, but you can go back to the Google site and get PDFs of everything that um, you can go to fox.com blog and get all of that sample code. Um, and you can reach me pretty much anywhere with jcom help and eog.o or just or anything else. And I want to leave time for questions. So, there it is. Thank you.
have a lot to talk to them. So I need to be able to get them to keep all the questions that people are asking. Um, so make sure I can hear you, and then I will repeat it, and then I will answer. Um, are there any questions? Well, the question is, is, is more about, um, or the statement of uh, being advised to steer clear of Sarah's typefaces in smaller sizes on the page um, because they might be hard to read. And uh, for a long time, that was really my instinct uh, because the rendering of Sarah's at smaller sizes was usually pretty poor. Um, the screen quality and, and the browser capabilities in the operating system have really improved a lot uh, in, in recent years. So I wouldn't say that that's necessarily the case. I think that you can set body copy in a set typeface and it can look really, really good. Um, but it can suffer from those problems. And especially, it becomes uh, extremely important that you check it in XP um, in other browsers and that kind of thing to make sure that it will render well. Um, the circumstances under which it will render poorly um, under 10 point or 10 pixel size, you probably going to really want to look carefully. Um, the other thing is that um, CSS3 lets us do a lot of things in opacity, and that's something that I certainly enjoy. Um, rendering fonts on something that is semi transparent over an image is a recipe for things to be really, really bad on a Windows machine that is not using a really modern browser. Um, it tends to look really good on a Mac, and especially for people in the room who are using Mac. Um, we can kind of mix the boat on some of the potential problems if we don't check the diversity. So it is something that we have to evaluate, but I would not say that it's off the table anymore. Um, the screen quality is really good, the font is really good, and there are some beautiful places out there. Um, the readability of a serif face it is generally quite nice, and that's why those serifs are there, to help all the stitch those letters together. Um, so, you know, it's a good one, it's really worth while. There's another question in the back earlier. Go ahead. Um, the question is about using rotation on your text. And, and is that going to impact the rendering of the font? And the answer is yes. Um, and it is, again, um, depending on the angle that you choose, the size at which the font is being set, um, it can be a really effective design tool and a really nice impact. Um, on my own website, I have something where things rotate a little bit when you, when you mouse over it along with the text, and, and it's not always perfect. Um, it's better. I mean, again, we're dealing with things that, you know, HTML5 um, is going to be an official standard this year with full implementation by 2020. Really, that's, that's actually what it is. Um, I'm working in HTML5 today. I'm using a lot of those things, but I'm also using a lot of things to make sure that it still works everywhere else, um, knowing what those pitfalls are. So you have to know that um, underlined in particular, um, if you have a link underlined and it is rotated, it will often draw poorly. So, you know, some of these things you just have to kind of gather your own little list of boxes and know what to look for. So maybe you don't underline things that way. Maybe you just use the background color to highlight or something like that. Um, but yeah, it, it can be great. You really just have to be careful. Oftentimes it's not for the shallow or whatever, it's a bigger deal. That's 45. Right? So sometimes that works better. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, the question was about performance concerns using web fonts for body text. And um, it has to load no matter what. Um, but things are loading faster and faster that I use it for body text all the time. Um, and if you are careful about the ones that you choose, I don't see any real issue. Because the interesting thing is, 
Um, there's no performance hit in drawing a thousand characters versus drawing a hundred. So if you're using anything at all, you may as well use it on the whole page. Um, and you know, it does introduce things that you need to make sure that it renders well. Um, because uh, what is often the case is that looking at it on Mac versus Windows, um, you might see things uh, in particular in the Safari or WebKit browsers. Fonts look a little bit smaller. Um, they might look a little bit more gray instead of really deep black. Um, so you might have to adjust the sizes a little bit more. Now that's actually by design. It's because it's being drawn more smoothly. Um, but the visual appearance of that is something that can really impact your design. So I don't think it's a performance issue when you follow those basic rules. Only enable the weights that you need. Now the thing is about using it for body text is that you need four. That's kind of a given. You have to have a normal weight, a bold, a towel, and a bold tower. So right off the bat, you're looking at probably 200 pounds or maybe a little more for what's being downloaded in font for your project or for your, for your site. Um, I don't think that's a real barrier. And then you throw in one or two other weights for the display space or for headings and things like that. You're still in the realm of under 300 pounds, people probably aren't going to notice. And you'll notice it even less if you use some of these tricks to sort of get the page to draw get it to approximate things well, and then when the font comes in, it's a very small adjustment of what people are seeing visually, and it was much less jarring. Um, there was actually one other thing that I wanted to mention on those lines. There is a CSS um, uh, attribute called font size adjust. That is supposed to help approximate that height and, and relative proportion of fonts. Um, it's only supported by one browser, it will eventually get better, and that may be another piece to add into font size, line height, and light spacing to help you kind of find new things. Um, but that, that's really more about the short term goal of mitigating the experience while the page is loading. But again, overall, I don't think there's really any significant issue in using it for a Well, the, the question was relating to the, the pricing with most of these services, and is that an influencer on should I make myself raise the service? That Well, it, uh, it's, you know, this is mainly about licensing. Um, and, and really what it comes down to is when you're using fonts on screen, they have to, uh, font vendors have to make a living. Um, they develop a huge amount of technology that goes into these fonts. They spend time hinting and spend time designing them and getting them to look really beautiful. Um, so they need to get paid somehow. So we're not buying a font library. Like a design house would go and spend eight or ten thousand dollars on a font library, and that would give them license to use all of the typefaces in their designs. But when we're talking about usage on the web and these services, we don't have to pay anything to go sign up and use one of these services. And so there has to be some kind of revenue model, and most of them have settled on something that ties back to page views, which to me seems really fair uh, because if we look at the traffic on the sites that we work on. Most of them would fall under a quarter million page views a month. Not all, but I think a fair number of people in this room would be just fine with that, and that's a whole ten dollars a month. Have access to twelve thousand fonts, or it's um, a little bit less than that uh, on some of the other services. But it's all in that ballpark. Have access to thousands of typefaces, and then you pay for usage. Now that can be across multiple domains, and that's what's kind of nice. I'm going to pay an account method to all of my clients up in there because the aggregate I'm still within that boundary. Um, where I've seen some issues come up is with uh, an organization that has literally millions of page views, and they already have their own CDN. Um, Boston University uh, gave a really good talk about that um, a few 
months ago, and their take was that they already have a CDN in place. They own the fonts that they want to use. They have the right to do it, so they want to host it themselves. Um, but, you know, I think over time, things will probably shift, but I imagine that there's a pay-for-use model that is probably all going to be Anything else? I'm always happy to share with you, uh, share what I've learned, so please feel free to ask any other questions you want. Um, get in touch with me through Twitter or email or anything else. I'll um, always be cards on the table.